climb aboard Duluth Homegrown Music Festival's moving stage. As it was playing, I was trying to figure out the logistics of keeping everything in arm's reach and not flying, <laughs> flying one way or the other. Especially on the trolley or any busking thing, um, you're opening yourself up to anybody. Mostly people seem pretty happy though. It's happy music. I think you're right, yeah. <laughs> They're way simpler than they look. I make things that hit things. Camp out with composer and music roboticist Troy Rogers and find out what happens at Duluth's Makerspace. It's anyone that has any kind of creative outlook on things is, has, has been here. These stories and more, this time on The Playlist. Funding for The Playlist is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. It doesn't usually bite unless you touch it in the wrong spot, but we're all that way a little bit. So now you can see. And there are elements that aren't, you know, that are on board that aren't really fully deployed yet. So once that, that hopefully later this summer that'll be operational. That adds a whole expressive element. Where they're way simpler than they look. I make things that hit things, basically. That's all there is to it on most of them. It's not just about hitting notes at a certain time, because that's kind of basic, but it's about shaping the notes and, and you know. Yeah, so you get the idea of some, of, and it's and it's it's voice-like. I mean, because it, it's mimicking uh, the the sort of resonant frequencies of the human voice. I'm uh, Troy Rogers, and I'm I live in Duluth, Minnesota, and I am a composer, musical roboticist, and semi-nomadic robot herder. Come look at something. This was the Musical Robotics Summer Camp uh, at the Lyric Center for the Arts in Virginia, Minnesota. Are we, are we connected? This. Should I this test? Track. Oh, yeah. We know we have power because we've got some of them working, right? What else could it be? Um, double. It's always exhilarating and, and exhausting, and that's just part of it. And remember, this should spark, and, and yeah. so let's see if it does. And it doesn't. So that tells us it's probably a problem with the, with the wiring. For me, it's a lot. I get a lot out of it because I get um, greedily as a composer, they work with these instruments in ways that I definitely don't, and probably most other adults wouldn't. They're largely uncorrupted by, you know, the kind of peer pressure and the social fears that sort of constrain creative. Uh, impulses. It's so important to get other people working uh, with these. I mean, you know, I have to admit that probably I'm not going to be the person who does the most interesting things with these instruments. Almost any instrument you can think of, it's not the creator, it's, it's all the people who m use and misuse the instruments. So in that context today, you know, that's a whole different mode of writing a song hands-on with, with robots. So today was really cementing everything together and you know having Galen here and doing her songwriting workshop you know okay let's let's make a song so there were some ideas that were floating around that really gelled it's always one thing to talk about this stuff and do it but you don't really do it until 
you've just got to press go and that's when you find out what you know and, and whether it works or not. So as a, as a proof of concept, performance is, is key. What translates and what doesn't, you, you, you quickly learn to adopt a different stance. It's called For Ziola. It was written for my, my good friend Leanne, who's a belly dancer. She uh, dances as part of Tribal Alchemy. On the road, it's for imaginary belly dancer and robots. Sort of a milestone of deploy, deploying the vocal robot in a certain way and really um, just letting the percussion, just the sheer physicality of the percussion robots just kind of let loose. It's just the automated beating of these skins and letting that, you know, just living with that and just sort of, it's a wash, you know, it's just let it wash over you a little. When it becomes a collective, real-time, physical, acoustic, phenomenon, then that is a moment for sure, yeah. We are at the Duluth Makerspace where creativity blossoms. Miranda Durbin is our guide and a shop manager here. Yep. Thanks for taking us around. Yeah, no problem. Okay, where do you start? Oh, well, this is basically the office and break area. And then we have 3D printers. So there's lots of fun things you can make with these. We have a couple running right now. Um, this one's actually making camera parts as we speak, but a really cool print that somebody did recently is this crazy skull that turned out really well. So there's all sorts of fun things you can make with them, whether it's parts or just doodads. And then we have some storage here. Uh, members get a tote bin or a locker, um, so they don't have to haul stuff back and forth. A, this is some of, this is our CNC area. So CNC stands for Computer Numerical Control. And they are basically wood routers. So this guy we created for our grand opening. And he, if he's plugged in, he does run, but I don't know where his plug is. <laughs> there we go. So, oh, <laughs> super fantastic. Yeah, so he's pretty funny. But there's lots of cool things. This is our X-Carve, so a couple different signs that were cut out on the X-Carve. Okay, what's this spot? So this is our wood shop. We have our tools around the outside and then we have work tables on the inside. We have most, a lot of the different tools you would need in a wood shop where there's a joiner, bandsaw, a lathe that we just got loaned to us from one of our members. And then our nicest pieces of equipment in the wood shop are actually these two right here, which we have a sliding miter saw, so you can do some nice larger pieces. And we just built this cabinet for it. And then a saw stop, which the cool thing about this is that it's a nice table saw that when skin hits the blade, it stops within an eighth of an inch. So you don't lose a finger. <laughs> I would guess safety is, I mean, everybody's priority. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge priority, and we do have a woodshop manager that does a, um, a safety woodshop safety class. He'll also do like a tips and tricks class, so I'd like to get the most out of your wood, that kind of a thing. So then this is our, this is our metal shop. So we have some metal shop managers that um, donated most of the equipment or loaned most of the equipment that's in here. So they take care of the equipment, they take care of the space, they make sure everything's kind of cleaned and picked up. So this is more storage area that I mentioned that we, we do have so that members can rent a chunk of sh a shelf or all of a shelf. So like this member is building a yurt. So Chelsea here is engraving something on our small lasers. These guys are 40 watt lasers. 
This is another example. It's an edge lit acrylic. So e either of these lasers will do a cutout and etch acrylic nicely. And then you just put LEDs on the bottom and it lights up. Looks all fancy. So in here is basically just a lot of electronics um, that members can play with. Uh, soldering station. And then this is our craft room. So we built this table in order for the teacher to be able to sit in the middle. You can pull that center out and then they can help all the students around the sides. So what, when you put this together, was it the idea people would, would come with their own ideas or it's like we just want to make a playground for creative people? What was the... It's, yeah, it's kind of a... We, we wanted to find all the different tools so that people would have some place to be able to use them. Yeah, so it's mostly the playground idea. Um, and, and then there's a lot of equipment that like, I never even knew existed or we didn't know it was around and other people would be like, oh, it'd be really great if we had this. So then we just kind of kept acquiring things. Who uses it and, and what have you seen that surprised you or like this is exactly what we envisioned? Um, it's pretty close to what we envisioned um, and the people that use it, it, like everybody. I mean, really, it's anyone that has any kind of creative outlook on things is, has, has been here. Why is the time right for Duluth to have a makerspace? It feels like it's been, the creative energies here have kind of been blossoming lately. Um, a lot of talk lately about how Lincoln Park is, you know, the, the craft district now and that there's all these buildings and companies and, you know, businesses that have been popping up in Lincoln Park and um, it's just kind of fun that we've been a part of that. So. Thank you for the tour, Miranda. Yeah, and you're Best welcome. wishes with Makerspace. Thank it's you. awesome. Yeah, thank you. They're these little synthesizers, they look like calculators. I had a couple of those. I had some samples on a phone, I was able to play that out. And uh, again, all battery powered, and one of those things that when you're on the trolley, there's no spare cables around. So I was lacking a couple cables I needed. So I had to, during my performance, I had to reuse the cables for different things. So that added another uh, element of difficulty. Um, and also then you're on the trolley and the trolley is now taking turns and everything's shifting so of course then I learned that I should have brought some tape with <laughs> to get a t somehow tether everything down. So it was, a, as I was playing I was trying to figure out the logistics of keeping everything in arm's reach and not flying, <laughs> flying one way or the other. I'm Tyler Scouten. Um, on the trolley I did a, a solo electronic set, uh, mostly a kind of a noise experimental set that was d outside of my normal uh, performances. <laughs> It was more difficult than I expected when I first said, sure. I thought, wow, this is something I've never done before. It's going to kind of push me into something I've, I'm out of my comfort zone, into doing, playing a set on a trolley. And typically, a sets on the trolley, t even back in the day when it was just people hopping on with an acoustic guitar, this would be a little bit different than that. I thought it would bring something new um, to the trolley. Good or bad, it was definitely something new. <laughs> You could do something, anything you would like. Two minutes later it might be a completely new set of people watching and you can do the same thing and play with that, play around, do different things you maybe normally didn't do or the first time or take, like that didn't work so well last time, let's do it again and change it up. And yeah, with that revolving uh, fan base coming and going, <laughs> it definitely, uh, definitely pushed the creativity a little bit. I was actually pleasantly surprised um, from people who I didn't know stopping me saying, hey, that was really interesting and fun, like 
do you do this often? And I had to say, no, I don't. I mean, I, once every couple of years, maybe I'll throw together some sort of electronic solo thing, but it's not a common thing that I do. Um, but yeah, hearing feedback from people I didn't know, people I do know, um, got even uh, friends of mine who you know are in the music industry as well, and we started talking about doing other things um, based upon that, which was rewarding for sure. But yeah, I would love to do it again um, because the, the challenge of it alone, this the, uh, the a moving automobile <laughs> careening down the street, full of uh, music fans, and then trying to perform during that, it's a lot. If you ever go down south, go down to Dixieland. Don't forget about the Clover Street cronies band. You better hide, honey, better hide from me. I can beat you plenty, and they just try to deal to me. Well, your preacher come to your house, just want to rest his head. Next thing he want to know where your husband is. Says that I don't know, he's on his way to jail. Come on, pretty mama, let us go as bail. You better hide, hide, honey, you better hide from me. And I can beat you plenty, and baby, try to deal with me. Get sore on that trolley. <laughs> Some big bumps. Duluth potholes. <laughs> Legendary. The audience was, you know, always changing. So, you know, you could play a tune that felt really, really good. And, you know, on the way back, the other way, you could say, ooh, maybe we should play that again. People were really into that. So, you could play. The same song twice, the second time a little rowdier, a little better. People dug it, ate it up. My name's Skyler. Uh, I play mostly the banjo, but a little guitar here and there as well. Uh, my name's Kyle, and I play the fiddle and the, um, the mandolin. I also play the guitar and the banjo. Whatever you need. <laughs> You know, people call it old time music. If you needed an overarching term, you could just call it folk music. It's just music that was uh, written by people um, in the community for people in that community.
J.P. Fraley was this really great fiddler who had this library of, of amazing tunes that um, were not your typical dun 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 dun, dun kind of thing. You know, and he was super um, offended by the hillbilly um, Hollywood association with Kentucky people and uh, fiddle music, and he had these really pristine, really complicated, <laughs> difficult tunes. Um, mm -hmm. Like that tune, Maysville, is what you'd call in this uh, genre is uh, crooked. It's not even four beats. You know, it's some some bars have five beats or something like that. So, um, and it, we don't really count it. I don't I have no idea. Mm -hmm. You kind of just learn it. You know, like you kind of learn a funny sentence. Eventually, it just makes sense or something. You know, you just kind of can learn the language. We usually play it, start it slow, <laughs> and slowly get faster because we, you know, it sounds like kind of a sad, melancholy song when you play it, play it slowly, and it sounds like such a joyful song when you play it quickly. So it's kind of hard for us to play at just one speed, it seems to we may well have, have a life of its own. moved all over the place. We will never know. Yeah. yeah. Let us know. I played the banjo for maybe like seven years, but uh, I never played traditional fiddle music until I met Kyle, and that's kind of all I want to play on the banjo nowadays, so that's how I figured out about traditional fiddle music, but who showed you traditional fiddle music? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I guess um, or do you I was, remember? yeah, I mean, I, w um, I went to the Harbor City School here in town, and there was a string band club, uh, Tom Maloney, you know, leading that, who I play with now. Um, and that would, I guess, have been the first time I heard uh, any kind of, you know, fiddle music. It's funny. It's funny that so many people can find so much beauty in it, and to other people, they can just, you know, shrug it off. I don't know. How have you found? Um, it's different everywhere you go. Up, uh, You know, it's different every day. That's what's cool about, you know, Doing doing a thing uh, every day, you get to, to really kind of discover that. So, um, and if you're, you know, especially on the trolley or any busking thing, um, you, you're opening yourself up to anybody. Mostly, people seem pretty happy though. It's happy music. I think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> I just kind of fell in love with like, you know, the plain song and the uh, kind of interesting melodies and then also the application of playing for dances. It kind of just keeps the schedule and the headspace full, so I don't know. <laughs> for me, I think a big part of it is how portable it is, you know, as I jump around or travel or go to a new place, I can take I can't really take an amp with me or a drum set, but I can take a banjo with me and um, 
It's a really cool moment when you can sit down with somebody you've never met before and you both know the same tune uh, and share a little, just a little moment with them. And it's also a cool moment when you don't know the same tunes and you end up sitting there teaching each other some new tunes too. It's really beautiful music. It's also got the same appeal as, you know, like you're collecting these songs and you're collecting these, um, these special items for people, you know? Remembering who you learned a song from and where, and it's just a really nice, nice way to spend your time.